Hello, hello everybody. Welcome to our Star Peace Wednesdays. I am here with the phenomenal Melanie Gillespie. I hope I've got that right and how I've said it. Is that right? Yeah. Who I am so excited to have as a guest. Um, we actually met through a series of serendipitous synchronicities um, and one of them actually included an introduction to money energies class which was so so awesome we're definitely going to talk about that today but the reason we got on the call today was because I saw a post from Melanie sharing that she has created this book which is called Star Silver Child Awakens and it is the first in a series of books which are called The Seven Stars is that right yeah now Melanie and I are certainly from the same the same space it feels like and I'm just so excited to have you here because I shared with Melanie just before that I went live with this that I just got the whole download of the synopsis of the Star Peace movies in detail I hadn't had before and I, I'm sure there is such a strong connection between these books and then what I'm being asked to put forward as a movie so I'm going to hand over to you lovely lady and you can share with us whatever you would like to value no, I said I was going to say something else first. Let's do that. So Melanie mentors highly gifted humans on their evolutionary journey. And one thing I absolutely love about Melanie is her capacity to take the metaphysical and make it really tangible, like to speak the, the language that some of us call woo woo. And then to really bring it into an understanding that anyone who's still kind of operating through the brain conditioning can comprehend and accept. So, yeah, you've been hugely inspirational to me, uh, Melanie. How are you this morning? Because it's really early for you, isn't it? Thank you so much. Yeah, I know it's great to be here with you. I love it so much. Thank you for, for those kind words as well. The Money Energies class, that was a lot of fun. Um, so, yeah, no, I'm really excited to be here and talk about Star Silver Child Awakens and other fun evolutionary pieces, just kind of like overarching piece about me you know I'm here in this human form I feel very much connected to and integrated into what I call my cosmic self and I just want to give a little bit of language so we have these kind of shared language you know whether people agree with that or not um, as we talk because I think we're going to you know I think a lot of things are going to blossom through as we talk today and it's going to be really fun so this idea of cosmic self um, is like the same thing as you might think of as your soul or your spirit or your higher self. I, it doesn't matter what words we use, really, our mental models are always going to be inadequate. But, you know, it's like using a, a hammer to split an atom, right? The tool is too crude, but we work with what we've got. And also words are important. And as you know, with your beautiful kind of reframe instead of Star Wars, Star Peace, words are spells and we have to cast wisely. So um, my cosmic self is very integrated into my human self. So you'll hear me talk a lot about like, oh, my human, as if that's a different being. It's not that it's just sort of like a sub piece of me, if you will. And, um, uh, and I'm really here at this time um, working, have been working really with earth as a being. So the planet earth is a being. Um, and up until very recently, until January of this year, 2022, uh, my primary inner focus in my esoteric work had been with the planet and uh, supporting her in her evolutionary journey. And uh, what happened in January of this year, late January of this year, was that she completed and closed all of her lower timelines. And then the message to me was, okay, like you're done with that work, that mission. And I'm putting all these things in air quotes if people aren't seeing me because that's actually part of the interesting evolutionary journey is this idea of like, do we have a mission? Do we have work? Do we have to do things? Are we in service? And the realities of these are things that we're dismantling. And, um, and there are so many different inversions that are within us around these ideas that we have to sacrifice ourselves, we have to martyr ourselves. If we're not in service in the highest way, then we're not doing good. If we're not okay, we're not existentially allowed. And, you know, really making that shift into the gifts, if you will, that we can bring through by really being ourselves, those are actually the gifts that have the highest impact. Um, and we have that craving to impact for a variety of different reasons. But in any way, sorry, I just kind of go down these little <laughs> they're really fun. But the but the evolutionary journey of the planet, and then and then my focus has been a little bit more uh on the evolutionary journey of humanity. And and it was in my own awareness that. It wasn't always the case that humanity had a path forward, actually, evolutionarily. 
And that opened up as well a couple of years ago and has been really fun. And, and that language for me is homo lumens, the move, the shift into homo lumens. And the marker of that is the integration of the Trinity within of the human, the cosmic and the original self within so the sort of Trinity within the human body. People do a lot of talking about like, I want to ascend. I want to go up and out. I want to get back to my star family. I want out of here. I want to go to heaven, um, you know, or like, no, we just have to only be here. Like that's all there is. It's bringing them both together, the cosmic and the earth then coming together within us. And so that's really the important piece there. And so the story that, um, that I bring through and I bring them through in so many different ways over my life, in my career, you know, I've run, you know, significant eight figure plus businesses and done all of that kind of stuff in various parts along the way in the journey. Um, you know, I've been around the sun a few times in this human form. I'm in my, I'm in my, my, where am I? My early fifties, 54. And, uh, and so I've had a bunch of different careers and I work, as you mentioned, um, in my mentoring work with highly gifted humans and I just mean by that the um, the neuroatypicality of being in the top two percent of brain kind of distribution of the brain side of things around potential for intellectual or creative uh, capacity and and so for me that has meant and for many that means we do a lot of different things so our career has a lot of different things going on or maybe there's one through line but we kind of move up very quickly as we go um and we also tend to be polymath and we'd like to do a lot of different things and i think you have this same experience T totally talk a little bit to so polymath or polymath Polymath is the is the term P O L Y M A T H is, is a term. There's other terms. It's like when we talk about like the idea of like a Renaissance man, right? Like someone who sort of like likes all these different things and is like, I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this, and this kind of interest in a lot of different, um, whether it's projects or skills or hobbies or you know, it, it doesn't really matter, but not the specialization. And uh, and so for me, one of the elements that has kind of flown through all of my career is the ability to kind of to weave the words to bring through stories that are in the moment uh, awakening or activating or opening for people in the way that's relevant to whatever's going on in that context and what has come through in my undergrad at Columbia was in English literature you know and I didn't understand any any of these things in this context at that time to be clear I know that there are some people who talk about oh, I came in and I knew immediately and I've been kind of walking along knowing immediately. Um, I think that's actually really rare. And I think that most people are kind of retroactively fitting in what's going on. And I can look back and see a million different fun stories around like, oh, that. And now I understand that kind of origin story, if you will, in a different way. And I think that's actually a beautiful journey for, for us all to go on. But the stories now that that came through a couple of years ago, I was given this series of stories that um, are in the, the the seven stars kind of book realm. And there's this, at the time I was told it would be seven books, but now it's not clear that it'll be that many because things have accelerated so quickly for earth um, and for humanity that I don't know that we're gonna need that many, we'll see. Um, but the core stories are um, about a young girl, her name is Nellie and she's 11 when we first meet her. And she goes through, and I don't want to kind of give things away, but she goes through um, some kind of crazy uh, experiences and adventures and immediately is sort of learning all these different things that she thought were true about who she, who she is aren't true. And she's sort of whisked away by this sort of mysterious stranger who she feels really safe with for the first time in her life. And she begins studying these seven arts which are these different kind of magic forms, um, if you will, that, that we might think of as just being more sort of the, the esoteric or metaphysical things that you know, we're playing with now to some extent, right? Um, she also meets a young boy uh, about her age who is uh, drawing and writing a graphic novel about a girl and a dragon. And he feels really compelled to do this. And these visions come through and sometimes he dreams about them. And when they meet, it's a big like, oh, because the girl who's been drawing is her. And so that's kind of opens up some interesting things. And she starts dreaming about dragons. And I'm not going to, again, no spoiler alerts. She also um, begins uh, kind of a new life living with um, this kind of new family, so to speak, and in, which includes this talking cat named Teleodor, 
who is an amazingly hilarious being. I love Teleodor. And actually, as I started writing the books um, and Teleodor came in, uh, he told me, and then we're going to do a whole series of books just about me, which is very <laughs> Teleodor. And it's going to be a, a series of books that's going to be the adventures of Teleodor. And it's for seven to eight year olds. But of course, others will like it. And it'll be, you know, very fun. And I was like, oh, that sounds really fun. Because he's not really a cat, right? No surprise. And all these interesting kind of cool cosmic adventures for Teleodor are coming. Um, and so things kind of unfold from, from there. There's a million different things that occur. There's a prophecy um, that uh, that kind of Nelly has to feel into, like, is this me? I don't know, what does that mean? There's other children who might be this prophecy and she becomes connected with all of them and they learn together and have different experiences. Um, she finds out that, um, nope, I can't say that yet. Ha! Uh, <laughs> I'm like, no, no, don't give that away. We have involvement with dragons, dragon realms, a magic school, um, traveling through a black hole. There's all sorts of interesting things that are going on. Um, okay, and, pause, pause for a sec. There's, there's okay. so much to repat and hit, like not to come back into because you you brought already all this expansion. I'm just going to say for anyone who's listening and, and watching, like notice how you're responding to Melanie's words, and even from the start of this conversation. Notice how whether you kind of expanded or contracted, like which parts of your being are tingling, because these words are codes of awakening. You know, as we're speaking, as Melanie said, words are spells and we're we're getting activated. And I don't know if you caught up, but last week we had Wendy Paquette on and she's she was someone that said, you know, she knew from birth sort of that her origins were not from here. Right. And a few weeks ago, I had Julie Gerland on, who is an amazing um for me, a mentor, she's 20 years ahead of me, you're 10 years ahead of me. I got an astrologer that's coming on that's 20 years younger than me soon. There's this, it's so interesting the way the women are kind of bringing this forward in this way and this wisdom. But this, this kind of talks about our time in the womb and how we can condition ourselves to thrive and that affects the planet too. But essentially, she had the kind of experience you're talking about the girl in your story in that she had this presence come along and that she had this enlightenment very early on in her life, which allowed her to hold that knowledge when obviously everything around seemed like it was just the opposite. I'm more like you, you know, for me, from what I've heard you say, it was more of a gradual like awakening to the fullness of my being. And I'm still not fully, you know, they haven't given me the whole picture yet. I think it would blow my mind. But two years ago was when I got the message about Star Peace. And it was 31st of December, sorry, 31st of October. So it's Halloween. Woke up with this message. The light in our universe is one. You know, Star Wars is over. It's time for Star Peace. This is your new mission. So, you know, we're talking very similarly here about like the directions we get. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I, I'm actually also working um, on a on a kind of a memoir book uh, because people ask me a lot who particularly who work closer with me or follow my I have a free podcast where I share uh, esoteric transmissions and people want to know my story a lot. I'm like, OK, well, I'm, I'll, I'll put some of that stuff down. I think it's fun. I I have awareness from an early age, from the beginning of. Of difference of certain kind of magical experiences that are very solitary. People sometimes will ask me, how would I describe myself from a kind of a muggled perspective, if you will, around my spirituality? And the language that I've always used is I'm a solitary esoteric mystic, which in and of itself is not very muggles language, but it's like the closest, farthest down, if you will, that I can come. And, um, and it's been a very kind of just me journey, just me on my own journey. And that doesn't mean there haven't been a lot of amazing people in my life, and I haven't had key teachers um, at key inflection points, but I've never been able to, I've never connected with anyone who's seen the whole thing. And, uh, and, and so it's really been on me to find and see the whole thing. Um, and I've had some crazy kind of mystic or esoteric experiences from day one. So I do think that's important to kind of mark for myself that it isn't like oh and then there was a day that came and things kind of turned on I also often I, I'm often not in human time at all and human time is like a line and time actually is a sphere and um and so I get human time wrong a lot 
And, uh, and so when, when you're talking about dates now, I'm like, oh, actually, it's probably almost three years ago now, maybe um, that, uh, or maybe even longer, I have to now go look because I'm going to be asked these kinds of questions as I start talking about the book now that I'm, I'm sharing kind of early reader access to people. Um, I'm going to have to kind of get some of these dates and times down, but maybe this will make somebody laugh and you'll resonate uh, as they're listening or for you yourself around like, oh, times and timelines and human time. It's like, oh, yeah. Who, who can do so that? different so different yeah who can do linear time it's so funny but yeah so it's I mean the whole journey is very interesting the my understanding of my role as it relates to humans is in this life is essentially a living bridge that is activating um you know on one level activating and opening the heart um and on another level activating and opening star maps within and you know helping people return to, uncover, reclaim, remember that which is already in them mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and kind of engage in whatever version works for them of mm -hmm. the kind of cleaning, clearing process of becoming an ever more kind of clear, clean, open, whatever we want to call it, conduit or container for all that you are as a specific, unique, embodied expression of the deep sacred current of life force and the kind of the deep sacred current of life force that animates and moves animates everything moves through everything grows all the time is shifting is experimenting is playing with different things having different seasons things begin things end um things mature things get started you know all of this and it's a very beautiful uh experience and i would say that communion with that and being an expression of that um, is probably the core organizing principle for my life. And I do think it's useful for us to be thinking about in my mentoring work with people, I will often talk to them around what is the organizing principle for your life at this time? And how can that then become kind of a guiding, a guiding light um, as we're making decisions about where to focus, which is a huge, huge challenge in many ways for highly gifted people because we have this all the things. And, you know, before breakfast, we have 8,000 great ideas. How do we decide which ones to do? It's a totally different experience than the experience of most people who are spending months and months trying to come up with the one really good idea for that phase in their life. And that doesn't mean that the quality of the ideas is better or worse. It's not about judgment. It's just a different experience. When you give yourself a gifted brain, you're going to have a different experience. And you did that on purpose. And it is one of many, but it is a very important precursor to that embodied multidimensionality leading to full pan-dimensionality, meaning that we have access to all of the dimensional perspectives within this human container. And an analogy that I use often to speak about dimensions so that people can kind of understand and play with it, um, particularly now as so much different, quote unquote, higher dimensional energy is coming into the planet and into humans and kind of within their kind of awake awareness. It's this idea of a, of a tall building and that each of the floors or stories of the building are different dimensions. And so the mental model that I work with for simplicity's sake is the idea of 12 dimensions. So we have 12 stories in this building and they're all looking out on the same landscape. And from different floors, you have a different view of the same landscape, of the same experience. And you see different things, you notice different things, certain things are available from different floors that aren't from others, et cetera. And we're in this fascinating and wild and deeply chaotic time uh, in society and for humanity where people are starting to, oh, I'm having like a fifth floor experience and a third floor experience at the same time. I'm having a seventh floor experience. I'm having a ninth. I'm having a twelfth. What what does that look like? And that kind of kaleidoscoping or or vacillating or oscillating like, oh, I'm looking from this. Oh, now I'm looking from here. Oh, now I'm looking from here can be very, very confusing for people. And it's important to be able to kind of come into some sense of coherence around it. And there's a lot of different ways to approach that, and any are kind of equally valid up to a point, but our human neurobiology is, we cannot pretend that's not there. Yeah. And yeah. so if we're not working with, how's the brain function, how's the nervous system function, as we're accessing more and more of this, then we kind of miss the boat. Um, I do, uh, you mentioned Wendy, I love Wendy, I didn't get to see um, her chat with you yet, so I don't know what you guys talked about. Um, when Wendy and I've had conversations in the past, um, 
you know, one of the things that I that I find really fascinating is, you know, she has a really beautiful experience of, you know, of unity, and which I think is really lovely, and it can be a really beautiful thing to connect into. And I do feel very strongly that it's important to recognize the interconnectedness of all things, the interconnectedness of all beings. We are all just specific little kind of fractals that are unique in their own way of this deep sacred current of life force. And, and the kind of the unity message can mess people up a little bit. It can really weaponize, it can be weaponized by ourselves against ourselves or against others. Um, and what I mean by that is from a kind of 12th dimensional, and again, let, we don't need to get into like, but I have 96 dimensions. Like, no, 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 it's fine. We're just using a mental model to make it easy to break it down, right? There's like, you know, it doesn't matter what's true, if you will, because what's true depends on which floor you're looking at it from. Yeah. And so from kind of a 12th dimension perspective, we can see that, yeah, I designed all this, I did all this. And from a third dimension or even a fifth dimensional perspective, the idea that the seven-year-old boy should be blamed for his cancer, for his leukemia is a problem. Right. And so how are we who are involved in and interested in supporting the collective shifts that need to happen and the societal shifts that need to happen, able to come into a more nuanced way of meeting people where they're at and understanding that the work of developing the capacity to express and experience what we might call personal sovereignty, the mastery of our personal sovereignty. Yeah, it's a birthright. Is it easy? No. It takes a whole lifetime for, for many to get to that place, to have that capacity. And we can't, if you will, impose in, in a non-commensurate, a non-equal degree of accountability and responsibility. Like they have to be the same, right? Or, or close to. And so we have to meet people where they're at as they're in that journey and, and help them along the way in various different ways. If we don't have to do anything, but- no, that's, I, the, I think, that's the invitation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think if we want to be helpful- Let's take a breath because there's, again, so much you've just streamed through and I'm like, just aware of everybody. Take a deep Thank breath. you so much for that, by the way, for stopping and kind of doing that because this oh. is a problem with kind of for me that I can just... Your, your words your words are phenomenal and I'm with you. Like that's how my brain operates too. And I, I want to come back to you in a moment, this idea of highly gifted and how that might relate to neurodiverse. And I also love what you said because... The way that others hear what is said very much depends on where their consciousness is at at this present time. And it can be in multiple places. So I'm a trans, I, I translate down a little bit, right? Or up a bit, depending on where we're at. And um, you're, you're a scream. I'm loving this. I've got my <laughs> celestial here, bringing all the cosmic coast through as well, and a little bit of uh, amethyst to ground. But basically, I, I feel like your language is so balanced in terms of your intention and the way I hear you between honoring the earthly experience and also the fact that we have this cosmic experience and we're here remembering that. And I, I just want to say at this point, if you haven't checked out Melanie's Facebook page, check it out, follow her because there's so much good stuff on there. Like I very rarely go on anyone's page to see what they've put on, but like I like to check out Melanie's because there's always something there. And that's the beauty of, of being in the flow of what you're in, but also being able to share it in this world in a relevant way that others get, even if it is just a little bit out of their comfort zone. So are you are you happy to talk? We, we need to definitely go into the money stuff as well, because I just think you have such an amazing, the way you expressed that was so beautiful when, when we actually did go through the sessions. But in terms of highly gifted, if I've got this right, because my my daughter loves a label, okay? She's 21, she loves a label. She's got everyone labeled, everyone saw it. It's part of that generation. My generation didn't want a label. We're all what we are, it's all good. But she, she has been diagnosed with ADHD herself and she really wanted that diagnosis. I spent her whole childhood going, you don't need a diagnosis. You are you. It's all good, right? But it helped her so much. And she says to me, oh, mom, you so have ADHD. And maybe I do, but I'm 44 years old and I've managed to make it work for me, right? In such a way that, yes, my mind and my... I'm not the I'm not the the most tidy person. My husband is amazing at keeping order. I'm learning to be tidier, but it's like I'm the creative like you. There's just notebooks everywhere, learning to be more able to channel it all in one space. And you know, my organizing principle at the moment is what excites me the most, right? What excites I've been trying 
those yeah. words are very important everyone to do what I think I should do but my default has been to find the most boring difficult long-winded way of doing stuff that I don't want to do right and I've kind yeah. of gone yeah if it's not fun I'm not doing it and I need to be excited yeah. So yeah. someone once said, I talk about delight. I talk about delight a lot. Like when you're talking about what's exciting to you, for me, delight is that kind of delight, like, exactly. delightful. Then I'm doing it. I'm in. That's not delightful. Not doing it. You know? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So a friend of mine who's a, she calls herself, well, she, she's a galactic healer of sorts and an amazing being. And, and she basically said ADHD stands for attention dialed into a higher dimension. I was like, yeah, I'm so taking that. But do you want to speak a little bit about what your experience is with, you know, sure. highly gifted and neurodiverse? Um, you know, I really respect the that the labels that are important to people. And even the word neurodiverse is something that is very important to a lot of people. I prefer to use the word neuroatypical because I find that it has a little bit more neutrality in it. And um, part of what I teach in the kind of process towards developing mastery of personal sovereignty is around boundary work. And uh, boundary work is kind of the gateway into that capacity for neutrality. And personal sovereignty requires the capacity for neutrality as well as the capacity to come into being at cause. And um, and so the neuro by neuroatypicality, I'm really just talking about if we look at kind of a bell curve of distribution of different sort of quote unquote brain types, for lack of a better word, um, we have all these folks that are out in the tail ends of that bell curve of distribution in various ways, right? So we can talk about ADHD, we can talk about autism, we can talk about giftedness, we can talk about you know a whole bunch of different quote unquote conditions um, or special needs or whatever we wanna call it, it doesn't matter to me, but these neuroatypicalities I feel are um, essentially variations on essentially precursor to embodied pan-dimensionality. And I say multi-dimensionality sometimes, I say pan-dimensionality sometimes, and pan-dimensionality for me is just what it, what it would sound like. It's all the dimensional access in the human, which is kind of the quote unquote end goal. There's not a goal and there's not an end, but like the end goal of really that full evo leap, that evolutionary leap that humanity is going through. Multi-dimensionality is we're starting to access different dimensions in our human form. And so we're kind of getting started with that and having that experience of being able to kind of see out from the different floors um, of the sort of the, the building of us. And so with ADHD, I work a lot with people who are kind of labeled both gifted and ADHD. It's very common. And many people have said to me that I also would fit easily into a diagnosis of ADHD. I'm like, yeah, sure, cool. Um, uh, yeah, bring it. <laughs> and, you know, to me, people with ADHD are kind of, are, are, are experiencing higher dimensions without a within their human 3D form, without the correct kind of training and supports, and without the context of the correct energetics around them and resonance, because it's happening earlier than sort of the societal or the collective structures are there to support that. Um, I feel similarly about autism. Um, and I often will kind of talk about both of these sort of states of being as being kind of time walkers as well. And that there's this kind of confusion of like, I don't, I don't, I don't understand as a being how to be in this three dimensional body. It's very confusing. Um, it's extremely hard. I mean, think for a moment about the reality of a soul, a spirit, a being, a cosmic self, whatever you want to call it. And depend, and everyone is different, but like, a really big one, for example, that's had a number of significant experiences in its sphere of life, right? Different, and I talk about this in my in my free podcast. So if people want to go deeper on the metaphysics, they can go there and it's at my site at the luminosity page. Um, the trying to kind of fit that down into the very dense 3D body. I mean, it fucking hurts. I hope it's okay for me to swear in here. I Absolutely. I mean, it fucking hurts and it's really hard. It's really hard. I, I mean, think about like when you, you know, when you open up like a, you know, you, when you get like a, like a blanket or a pillow or like a mattress in the mail and they kind of shrink wrap it and it's all like, and then as soon as you cut into that, it's like, it opens up again. There's no way you're putting it back in there. That's the experience of a soul trying to kind of really be of a cosmic self trying to be in this physical body. It, for some it's easy and it's joyful, but for many it's really, really hard. And I know you are very attentive to and, and thinking quite a bit about, you know, the star seeds, so-called star seeds, 
this is part of their challenge is like, how do I even just deal with this 3D? And what am I even doing here? And why? And whoa, who designed this? You know, it's like, well, we designed it. Um, yeah. And, yeah, sorry. Uh, you know, but, you know, so anyway, so, so I think with ADHD, um, again, we just have to meet ourselves and others where we're at yeah. and find yeah. what's useful in that time. Uh, people often like to talk about things like the golden rule, do unto others as you would do unto yourself. No, I think more of like what I think is called the platinum rule, do unto others what they would want done to them. Like instead of imposing, centering it on yourself and what your experience is and pushing that onto other people, what, where are they at? Can you see them and meet them where they're at from a place of neutrality, not from a place of one up or one down judgment? And what can you bring into that interaction that would be useful? Okay, let's just pause there for a sec because that's so powerful that I don't want it to get lost. You know, I've never heard of this platinum rule and I love it. It's absolutely beautiful. And as you say, it's really like, if you like, a, a sort of a measure of our evolution is our capacity to be able to kind of chameleon like the ship you know shape shift and, and meet people where they're at meet meet with the message in a form that it can be accepted wherever someone is ready and even that's just pure love and I think that's so important because the the whole thing around labels this is to me part of the separation from source if you like and this identity self identifying in segments to reunify you kind of have to separate out a bit and go well what do I feel I am who do I feel I am where do I feel I fit in oh let me create something new that feels right for me what I find really strange and I have since I was really little is what why is normal shut down normal is shut down right normal is you can just fit into whatever normal is the school system right but it's I noticed it more in terms of how much can you actually squeeze yourself and play by these rules versus how much is doing that going to make you implode or explode or whatever? And that was the main difference between my daughter and myself is that I managed to be squeezed into a system. It was detrimental to me, the way it played out and the way I had to deal with it was hard, but she just couldn't do it. It was like not happening, right? Yeah, and yeah. It happened at certain times. And I feel this is really important for parents at this time to recognize that, you know, what did you call it? Not neurodiversity, but neuro atypical atyp it's not going to go away because we're all like we're and, all and it's, and it's why we're seeing these diagnostic labels just skyrocketing so it's like i've and, now got five and, labels you know right. and that experience of of you know you and i we we tried to cram ourselves into these tiny little boxes of quote unquote normal or typical or what was supposed we were supposed to do to our detriment and then the next generation um is like i can't it's just it just all blows up, which is, by the way, good. It's, I mean, it sucks for them in the moment, but it's useful to the societal trajectory to be forced to see it's no longer outliers for whom the education system doesn't work. It's no longer outliers for whom are kind of extractive economic structures that organize how people think about work and money and blah, blah, blah. They don't work for anyone. There's no normal, it doesn't exist. One of the things that I studied when I was an undergrad a million thousand years ago in New York at Columbia was this concept of the myth of the center the, in, in American, and sorry, this is focused within American stuff, but it also within certain kind of feminist and, um, uh, and post-colonial uh, schools of thought. This idea of the myth of the center, the myth of there's this sort of perfect thing at the middle that everyone wants to try to get to and is trying to get to or be, it doesn't actually exist. And it's there to essentially kind of torture you, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? And, and you look through any structure in our society, any institution, any, any structures that exist, and you'll see it everywhere, you know? And when we come back to the idea of stories and the importance of stories, one of the things that I learned earlier in my career, um, I ran a large kind of philanthropically organized organization that also was involved in doing social enterprise and so kind of earning money and then putting that money back into various philanthropic pieces as well as stewarding existing financial resources. And at, at a certain point, we were very interested in 
I was very interested in what are the what's effective in social campaigns, right? What's actually works and looking at various different ones. And I had created this whole um, kind of graduate students fellowship program. And, and it was a multidisciplinary fellowship program on purpose where it was like from these disciplines that were all relevant, we felt in this different science areas to our uh, focus for the organization at that time. And I essentially was able to say, look, you guys go off and do like an internal research project and research this. What kinds of social campaigns work? How do we change social norms? What actually works? What does the literature actually tell us about this? Because people have a lot of opinions uh, in the kind of policy systems and environment world about how to do that, but what do we actually know? And what they kind of came back with after an extensive kind of you know meta study of the, of the literature was nobody actually really knows. There's roughly sort of seven different schools of thought about how to go about it, but there isn't any data to say that any one is particularly more important than the other. What we do know, and many others have talked about this in various different spaces, if you're kind of a data nerd or a science nerd like I, I have been over my life, that data doesn't change people's minds, stories do. And that makes perfect sense, right? Stories are how we get into the heart. If we engage people at the brain level, for some people, depending on what we're engaging them with, that is the entry point. But if we're looking to kind of help people with transformation in some way, whatever that looks like, kind of the you know neutral to whatever the content of that transformation, it's going to be the story, what gets into the heart. And, and so when we then, that organization kind of engaged in story work from the perspective, it was very freeing. It was like, ah, great, we're going to go do stories the way we feel is right. And I'm, you know, I've written before, and I'll, I'll probably write a little bit more about this, about the kind of the closeted mystic in the boardroom, which was me, because I, ha I, I really had this sort of double life at that time of like, I'm this mystic, I'm receiving enormous amounts of information and guidance in my own kind of human access to my quote unquote magic is expanding really rapidly, like really fast. And I'm trying to bring it in through this organization that I'm leading that I feel is a very important, powerful kind of, you know, sort of tip of the spear on certain key things that I want to see shift for humanity as we, you know, the, the one through line for me throughout my entire career has been a shift from me to we me to we, me to we. So everything is kind of organized, has been organized around that in my earlier career years. But in the boardroom, nobody wants to hear about, well, this is what I risk. Like you can't, you just can't even talk that way. You can't bring any of that through. And in fact, just even being a woman in the boardroom is a problem, you know, and we have a lot of data about that as well. And it was a fascinating experience for me to have uh, you know, working with multiple boards over the years, but to just essentially that sort of subtle the very subtle sexism. I didn't ever have to deal with the very overt problematic stuff that many do. And I'm very fortunate in that regard, but the subtle stuff, like it's, it still gets in there. It still messes with you. It still kind of warps things. And when I left that and I was, it was, this was uh, almost exactly five years ago, five years and a couple of months. When I left that, I was like, I'm never dealing with a board again. I'm never reporting to anyone again. Like even at that high level, you're still reporting to a board. And this is true if you're running a public company, if you're running a private company, but you bring in investors, you're reporting to them. Like if you have a vision that you're really here to do, my only kind of top level advice to you is don't give away the power over that vision. Mm. No matter what, don't sell it out. Don't. Mm. If people want to invest in you, let them invest in you. They don't get to buy a piece of you as a result. Mm is my message to people. If you have a kind of social good project and, you, and you're thinking about starting a nonprofit, don't. Mm -hmm. It's a very damaged structure. Don't mm -hmm. do it. There's so I, many faster, better ways. You're, so you're, but back to the stories. Now you, you take us into the money. I think this is a really important segue. And just before we go there, I don't think, I don't know how much we've talked about this, but my kind of expertise, if you like, is in pre-birth influences, birth, and then the immediate postnatal period and how. Oh, I didn't know that. That's fascinating. Uh, so from preconception through to first seven years of life. And that's why Bruce's work is so important to me because it kind of underpinned every, every intuitive, like from training as a pregnancy yoga teacher to then training as a coach and the different work I've done, he's always been in there. And yeah. the main shift that the mainstream if you like is coming to now is that you know we've been given this story this darwinian story of survival of the fittest and you know it's a 
me or you kind of world and yet it's based on flawed data and really you know again this idea of this man's world and also socioeconomic status because it wasn't even darwin's theory it was someone else i think it was wallace's theory i can't remember his name but lamarck's theory is where it's all at lamarck's do you know about all of this yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. go ahead go of course ahead. you do so just for the for everyone else you know we're making a shift from this idea of genetic determinism into this idea that our nervous system is really at the key of whether we survive or thrive. So when we're talking about the masculine world, when we're talking about patriarch, when we're talking about boardrooms, et cetera, we're talking about the stifling energy that is actually coming from buying into that narrative that is actually really inaccurate in terms of when we look at nature and interpret nature, but it's coming through the eyes of conditioning, right? So Let's just open up now to this idea because money is conditioning too. And for most of us who are heart centered, there's some kind of issue with money being a bad thing because we've seen of the terrible things that have, have occurred through money. But let's just remember what I just said, because what I've just said is based on survival, therefore lack consciousness, therefore greed, therefore this idea somehow that you know we have to fight for it. Yep. That there's yep. not enough for everyone. So over I to talk you. About, I talk about the old evolutionary imperatives of survival and how that is essentially kind of what occurs in those first seven years of life. Um, similarly, and very nested in kind of the human sciences, neuroscience, epigenetics, psychology, human development across the lifespan, flourishing, blah, 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 all of that good stuff. It's very important. And, and, and sometimes I will talk within some of my private uh, body of work with people about the idea of the epigenetics of the soul. And epigenetics, for those who aren't familiar with that term, this is what, you know, this is really what Lamarck's thing is really talking about. It's this idea of, um, Essentially, the way to think about epigenetics is essentially how the body changes based on experience, how the body responds to experience. And so, you know, you kind of have your genetic code that you're born with, and then your genes express essentially kind of on off on off all these different genes express differently based on context, based on experience. And there's very little about objective reality that has anything to play with that because it's this interpretation of how you're interpreting your experience that matters the most. But we won't, we're not going to do a science lesson. Um, <laughs> even though I could, and it's really- I, I love it when you, you do, right? When you can explain science, because for me, I'm like, but, but I know it's true. I just can't remember. Yeah. Yeah, it's so fun. I mean, it's so fun. It's so fun. And so the, this is why the neurobiology is so central and, and in the kind of, you know, kind of one on one level of the body of work that I share with clients privately in small groups or one on one. I'll talk about kind of, OK, be reductive for a moment and think about the systems within yourself or the domains within yourself of nervous system, brain and spirit. These all work together. They nest together. And we have to essentially come into skillfulness. And then, you know, expand capacity in our skillfulness with each of these areas. And the whichever one is the least capacitated, if you will, will pull the others down. So we can have like a big sort of spirit, like, oh, I had the big, I had the big aha, or I had the big experience, or I had the big reveal, or the big download, or I went on like a journey of some sort, you know, all this different, like, and I got the whole vision, you know, it's, 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 you know, the, the three movies, it's the, you know, the books, it's the whatever it is, like a, the, the new business, it doesn't matter. I got it, right? But if the brain systems or the nervous systems aren't also supported to expand to that new level, and this can also be true if it's just like, I have this new access to new dimensional access, right? Like, so whether it's about you know, I, everything I just described is about like human doing, but it can just be like, oh, I just, I was in this experience and I know I was having this like ninth dimensional experience here in the, in the 3D or this 11th dimensional experience here in the 3D. But what do I do with that? If my nervous system and my brain are not supported and I don't have the skillfulness to kind of help it expand to handle that larger kind of spirit side of things, that it all collapses down, which is where so much of the pain and grief that people experience is. Um, sometimes I recur, re, refer to this as the retreat effect, right? Like you go off to the retreat or you go off to the journey or whatever it is, all the cool things come through or all the experiences are had or all the kind of healings or openings or, or closures or whatever occur, you think. And then you go home and you can't recreate it at home and you can't live it at home and you can't live it in your regular life. And now you not only 
are back in whatever shit show you were in, but you have the grief added on of, I had this other experience. Why can't I get back to it? And what people tend to do in those situations is they tend to blame themselves. Sometimes they'll blame, you know, whatever was happening there. It depends on kind of what's going on, but they'll do what's wrong with me. Why can't I have that? I'm defective. I'm stupid. I'm blah, blah. It doesn't matter. So with money energies, just because I, I, I want to bring this back around. So, I mean, on a basic level, money is just like a hammer. We don't blame the hammer when somebody uses a hammer to smack somebody in the head. We blame the person who's misusing the hammer to smack somebody in the head with it. So money has a neutrality to it in some respects, on some levels. Again, back to the different stories, the different dimensional perspectives. But my experience with money and people that I work with, whether they're my clients or just people that I know who come into a more expanded, if you will, uh, multidimensional experience within themselves are able to actually come into connection with money energies themselves. And money energies, we can think of that as sort of like little little fractals, little bits of, of energy expressions from the deep sacred current of life force. And it wants to move, it wants to flow, it wants to create, and it's looking for portals, if you will, to kind of come through in order to do that. And it's not about the volume or the size of the money. So you can have really high money energies attached to $5. You can have really low, heavy, dense, you know, rough money energies attached to a billion dollars. And in fact, that's what we've seen on this planet for a long time is that that has been the case is that most of the time people who are dealing with a significant amount of money are often really fucking miserable human beings. And, you know, I work with millionaires and billionaires throughout various different components of my life. And most of them are really wretched and trying to figure out like how to do things differently. Um, and which is sort of like, you know, for people who are not millionaires and billionaires and maybe struggling to like pay for groceries or like, oh, boo hoo, totally get that, right? There is a reality in the physical world, in the 3D around a kind of, you know, hierarchy of needs kind of thing. Um, uh, and we can't deny that. And when we try to bypass that and just be like, oh, if you're poor, it's your fault. That's weaponizing spirituality. See my earlier comments above around that, right? Yeah. Um, what I really am focused on uh, energetically for and have been for my whole life is this shift from extractive to regenerative. Yeah. Extractive to regenerative. And you can see that in our economic structures. You can see that in our relationships with the earth. And the, and the rest of the natural world. People often say the natural world is if humans are different from that. Humans are part of the natural world. Stop doing that. Stop letting people be like, oh, out there in the natural world. No, no, no. Artificial technology, man-made stuff. That's not the natural world. We are the natural world too, right? Cut it out, cut it out. Stop doing that. So, but it's so important. And so the, um, the kind of the extractive relationship that we have with the earth, right? Like, let's go and we'll just take whatever we want and we won't have any communication with those beings. Um, and of course, not everybody believes that earth is a being. Not everybody believes that, you know, stones and mountains and fields and rivers and oceans and, you know, that there's all life in those, you know, um, that's my experience. I'm regularly just walking around in my day to day in communication with all that and coming into a honorable relationship where you're asking can I take this apple off of your tree right now is that okay with you you know uh can I how do we come into honorable relationship where we're actually regenerative in some way in terms of the exchange that's occurring and that's the that's the shift that society will make and uh if it if it decides to uh move into higher timelines as a whole and we can bring that down into our own into our own lives where our relationship with money energies if we're kind of connecting in with higher kind of regenerative money energies they want to come through us from wherever the source is that you know like you know uh, i'm going to pay somebody to do a thing right so my money money energies are going to come through me to go to them it's not just about my relationship with them and the value exchange between us that yes, that's important, but that's just one layer. There's mm -hmm. also then it's going to go move through them to do stuff. And are we kind of opening that? That's that kind of those different mm, kind of uh, you know streams, those different rooms for current portals for current to occur. Um, and it's really fun, but but it comes back to 
fundamentally when, when money energy stuff isn't working for people to the relationship with what I call provider energy, which occurs first in humans in the womb. People often think of when I say provider energy, they're like, oh, that must be about man and authority. And, you know, like, no, 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 I don't, I don't engage with any of that. And it's in the womb. It's the first time that a human has the experience of what I call provider energy, where everything that we need is provided by our mother's body. And what's going on during that experience is vital to what occurs next and uh, and how we kind of deal with it. So anyway, that's my kind of my... Well, no, that, that's that's really really i really want to go into that a little bit more actually because there's a couple of questions i want to ask you and i'm just aware we're coming to about 10 15 minutes left and we need to get all your details of where people can find you but we'll make sure we do that and i do want to talk about big stories in the wild in a minute so let's okay let's, we'll, we'll, we'll go into minutes. that so what i was curious about was basically um you know, for most of us, we've grown in the soup of adrenaline rather than oxytocin, right? That's the o adrenaline dominance. So it's put us in this state of there's not enough fight, flight, freeze. That's our normal rather than the other way around. And, you know, if, if there's one piece of advice you would give to someone, because I see this in the world of creatives, which I'm working with at the moment, is the low self-worth that leads to the not asking for enough, they're not expecting enough, they're not showing up in the way that they can actually attract the resource to put what they want out into the world in an effective way. But essentially, if someone's stuck in lack, what's the one thing that you would say to them would be the most helpful thing to start with? Just let it come through, whatever it is right yeah. now. No, it's so, that's so hard. People always, people do ask me that question a lot. What's the one thing? And it's like, it really depends on the person and where they're at. It's a very individual thing. Um, I would think if people are stuck in lack or scarcity or, and people often think of I'm stuck in lack and scarcity and that means I don't have anything. People can have a billion dollars in the bank and be stuck in lack and scarcity. And I wanna be really, really clear about that. Um, and if you have a sort of tendency to kind of be, if you're really focused on hoarding in any way, like, oh, all I really care about is wealth creation. Why do you care about wealth creation? Ask that question. What's interesting to you about wealth creation? Well, because then I'll be safe if I have a billion dollars in the bank. Okay, now we know what we're dealing with. You know, uh, if I if I'm interested in wealth creation simply because I want it to flow through me in order to kind of fuel the kind of the you know what I have as this vision, then that's different and more interesting. But if we're dealing with the kind of like essentially fear based uh, uh, experience for people, then ultimately what I would tell people is there's no quick fix to where you're at. You've got to go do this intense inner work and you've got to find a place to do that work, whether you're doing it yourself in a self-guided manner or with a mentor of some sort, you've got to do this work and it has to include nervous system, brain and spirit. If it doesn't include all three of these, then you will not get all the way there and you will have this snapback effect that I described earlier of like, oh, I'm doing better, right? have to do all three it's like non-negotiable so you need to find resources whether it's you know for self-study or the organizing for yourself or um working with a mentor that have deep grounding in the human sciences and the kind of the spirit side the esoteric side that resonates with your own being that feels right to your own being right um and so there's no like one person this the idea of like oh the one person who's the best right the yeah. age of the guru is dead the age of the guru is dead. The whole kind of concept of like luxury offers, of icon offers, of like, I can show you the way. No, that's all 3D gone. It's already dead energetically. And so people need to, people can do whatever they want. But that would be my advice is to kind of look into that and feel into that. I have a number of free resources for people that can kind of help spark some of this for them. There's um, my Luminosity podcast, Transmissions from the Lake. Everything is at my site, melaniegillespie.com, and I'll give you the links, but the Luminosity podcast, I actually just uh, published my 70th episode, and this just, this wasn't a plan. This was, again, like, you know, it's just, I do what I'm told. It was just one day uh, I was told, oh, we're moving. Oh, okay, where are we moving to? I don't know. Go drive around in this area. Okay, driving around. Oh, we're going to live at this lake. Okay, cool. And, you know, it sounds very matter of fact. It was really like, wow, oh my God, so cool. Like this new communion, this new collective of the lake the energies that I was experiencing. And then within a few days of moving into what I call Lake House One, I'm now in Lake House Two, um, I uh, was told, okay, now you need to start recording transmissions and sharing them publicly. And I was like, what? Woo. You know, like, yeah. really, we're yeah. going to do that? I think that was November of 
2020. And so I started doing them and it's just whenever they come through, I do it. There's no like every Monday and Wednesday, you know, it's not like that. It's just, they come through. Sometimes there's four in a week. Sometimes there's nothing for three weeks. Um, and, uh, and so that's a really fun free resource for people. I also have been bringing through um, two waves from spring of 2021 and spring of 2022 of what I call the founder codes and the founder beings are, I describe all this in free transmissions. Um, but these founder codes came in, in the spring of 2021, and then a second wave in the spring of 2022, um, in order to, and that's, sorry, that's Northern Hemisphere spring. Um, and that's, uh, they came in to essentially to kind of accelerate the evolutionary journey of the planet, but also specifically for humanity. And so I have been doing that work of bringing those in privately. And then I've been doing, sharing some of that again, privately within certain private communities, but uh, just a couple months ago, maybe, maybe a month ago, I don't know, whatever. Recently, we'll just see if that word is better. Uh, recently, I was told, okay, it's okay now. And because I've always had this push pull around, I want to give everything for free. I don't want there to be a financial barrier for people. And Money Energies is really clear with me. They're like, if you do that, you will devalue the work. It won't work for certain things. And I'm like, okay, I just do what I'm told right? You tell me what's the number. We'll just go with that. And that's how I do all of my so-called pricing for my services. With the founder codes, initially it was, all right, package founder codes so that they can be digitally available to people outside of, you know, these more, you know, because my private containers are, they're not inexpensive. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you know, they, they vary. There's a kind of a, a big range, um, but like we're talking high four figures and up to like six figures and a bunch in between, depending on where people are at. And so I wanted to have digital uh, materials available that felt really powerful for people at a kind of more accessible level. And then recently, and so I put those out and then I was told, okay, now you can do a pay what you choose option for people. That energetically, the, the energies, if you will, are ready to still hold the, the, the potency of those codes so mm -hmm. that it doesn't get degraded by the reality that most humans don't value what they don't pay for. Exactly. We don't, we don't, we don't do it. We're like, yeah. we just completely devalue it. But I so have made that complete library of the founder codes is now available with a pay what you choose option and there's no excuse. So I would say to anybody who's having what you're talking about, even though it's not organized around the concept of dealing with lack, go access that. Mm. Spend oh. time working with those materials they're incredibly powerful. The things that people say when they are working with them, even just the first version, the first of the, there's sort of seven kind of core things that are there um, are just like, oh my God, like it's just a game changer. It's a game changer in that evolutionary journey. Perfect. Well, we'll definitely put those links on. Let's go on to what you wanted to talk about. So this was the yeah. big, tell me, tell me. Big Stories in the Wild is my project around, uh, it's my multimedia project that I'm just getting started with and Star Silver, Star Silver, I can't say that quickly, can I? I'm usually reading it and I'm not talking about it. Star Silver Child Awakens is the first, first kind of publication for Big Stories in the Wild. And, um, and it is essentially to bring forward stories in multimedia form. So it's books and also on the screen um, uh, that open hearts that, activate star maps within and that are stories that are thrilling and exciting to read but don't trash your nervous system and we need to shift that paradigm and this is where you and I are just so like you know just simpatico aligned completely here doing the same thing in this regard is stories that don't trash the nervous system that's the new way we've got to go that way we've got to make that available and mm -hmm. and I want to say that I don't want to I'm not dissing stories that are intense in your nervous system. That's not what I'm doing. Like I love a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm also not here to trash, you know, entertainment or stories either. And I know there's a lot of people who are kind of like purists and are kind of like mm, looking down on this stuff. You know, mama loves her story time. That's an important part of like my evening is story time, whether I'm reading it or I'm watching it on screen. I love that time. And I find it to be a very important part of my own self-care actually to have for my brain to be able to kind of like, okay, we're going to turn all that off for a little while and be really immersed in this beautiful story. But I'm very careful about what I, what I watch and what I connect to. The seven stars books are also like very quickly after I was told these are to come out. 
and this is what's going to occur and here's some things for you to do. Um, I also then was later told um, and they're going to go onto screen. And not that they're going to go on to like a single movie screen, but a series and a very high end, high production value series that is for adults, that is not animated, that is, you know, like like kind of an HBO, you know, or an Apple TV version of, you know, when we see a really beautiful production for these stories as they start coming out and that I would be involved in that in that work in some way. And so this is all big stories in the wild. And currently it's really the home for my own projects that I'm bringing through. The world of the seven stars includes these first books um, about Nellie and the other so-called possibles, these other children, um, and all of her adventures. There's the books about Teliador, his adventures. There's actually books that will be coming soon that I've started working on as well that are um, about uh, the biological parents of Nellie and kind of their story. Um, because as that came through in the first book, there was this whole like, oh, we want to go play in that world. And that will really be written for adults because it's it's a kind of a cross genre, you know, romance, scientific adventure kind of story. And um, and then, yeah, and then there's companion pieces to the to the uh, seven stars books themselves. Gray's graphic novel, Gray is the young boy that I mentioned who's writing the graphic novel, that graphic novel actually will exist and will be given to people. Um, and there's going to there's some fun, interesting aspects of how to interact with that that I don't want to give away yet. Um, and then inside the story, Nellie finds this small old book that is this old kind of academ academia book that is where she finds this prophecy and some other writings about kind of cosmology. And that book itself will be its own kind of standalone book as well. So we have just all these different things that are coming out to, um, to do that. And, and so Big Stories in the Wild is just really just, it's so, it's just, a, that'll be kind of the imprint, if you will, for publishing and for production um, of, of film media. I'm so excited about that. I, I'm seeing a whole it's something I've been thinking about a lot because you know we've obviously got Gaia TV, we've got Netflix. I mean, we're on the same page in terms of I love watching stuff. You know, I, more than reading these days, I actually find it really. Yeah. There's so much information coming through this way that I, I, it's just easier to watch and sit back rather than be more active. But that's just where yeah. it is now. However, yeah. like, wouldn't it be lovely to co-create a whole new platform that's like oxytocin fueled entertainment and like yeah. just allowing us to know that we can have that thrill? I mean, you wrote, I'm trying to remember how you wrote it in your post, but it was, it was exactly this idea of thrilling. Let's see if I can find it. Um, <clears throat> do you remember how you, how you put what, it? What I say is, um, what I say on my site about it, this is the first production from Big Stories in the Wild, a multimedia project from Melanie Gillespie with the mission of bringing forth stories that open and activate the hearts of all people. Big Stories in the Wild, oh, here's what you want. Big Stories in the Wild provides what the human soul now craves, stories of thrilling delight that prove suspense is not the sole domain of fear-based nervous system racking stories that predominate the publishing and media world at this time. Exactly that. Oh, thrilling just... delight with suspense, yes. Well, and it's kind of like, you know, we look around, like where's the kind of quote unquote, you know, non-stressful media, like Hallmark Channel, like, no. It's, it's, yeah. it's tough to find and you, you basically just get this, you know, if you go on to the rom-coms, because my Netflix uh, is very different to my husband's. Like when you look at our kind of what we put, you know, the things that are suggested is so different, but it's such a boring formula, you know, yeah. like the, the current system. And anyway, I am seeing new things sprout up, which are really exciting. Yeah. And I'm well, so planting the energetic codes. I mean, I think what I want people to hear also, so I work um, predominantly with either professional creatives um, or entrepreneurs, occasionally with folks who are kind of in, in significant corporate jobs. And what I want people to know is that when you're focusing on your creation that aligns with this, if you're resonating and kind of like, yeah, I have a thing like this too, like, oh my God, I have the same vision, like, great. Like, don't be like, oh, now I better join, you know, one of these visions. No, 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 just do your thing. Do you? What we're doing is we're, we're in this, it's like wild, wild west kind of model. And we're in the very, very early days. We all have to kind of plant these kind of energetic sort of like lightning rods where we're planting them by doing the work, just even like get like, nope, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to actually get some words on the damn page today. And, and I have to talk about writing in a minute, but the, like just whatever you're doing to kind of bring it that much closer to being in form 
is, if you're doing it from that place of delight and excitement and the resonance of what you're bringing in and how it's going to change things, anchor that. Just keep, boom, anchor it, anchor it, anchor it because you're spreading that energetic, like huge. It's like a sort of shockwave energetically around the world every time you commit to that and are excited and delighted with it. And that's actually what's driving us internally to do these projects. It's mm-hmm. more about that than even the projects themselves, yeah. and which can be hard for our egos to hear, but it's true. <laughs> well, we, have to, we have to be unattached to outcome, right? Because in the mid, this is my star piece book, and I'm writing everything in. And this is the first time I've been so excited about anything. But what it comes down to is, I was gonna. The last question I was gonna ask you was about hundred monkey syndrome, but you're literally talking about it right now in the sense that as we're joining together and we're all having these similar ideas, it's like going vroom out into the collective it only needs to pick up a certain amount of momentum and then everyone's like that's the norm right you want to speak to that or go to wherever you want to well I mean I think so we're bringing it all through and I think this actually really so yes and sort of tipping point hundred monkey whatever like all of these things we want to kind of encourage that absolutely and it is occurring um I I also want to say that I think there's a there can be a tendency for people as they're kind of starting into this and they're feeling and they're bringing within themselves like, oh, that's the stories. Oh, that's the thing. That's the, you know, the, the films, the, the TV show, the books, the whatever, the screenplay, the, the, the script for the play. It's, and stories also can come through visual art, of course. There can be a protectiveness, like, no, that's my story. I can't tell anybody. And, oh, somebody's going to rip it off. There can, that can happen. And we're very rife. We're very kind of open to that right now, that kind of worry. And what I want you to know is, and also the other flip side of that, and I see this often with gifted people, is I have all these great ideas, and then I didn't do anything with it, and then somebody else did it, and I feel like, oh, no, that was my idea. It's not, none of it is my idea. None of it is your idea. It's nobody's idea. It's coming through us. We are vehicles for it. We are portals and channels and conduits for it because we are conduits of and expressions of the deep sacred current of life force. And it's, you know, we're that. So when you can have less grippiness, right? I talk about it as tree frog mind when we're like grippy, grippy, grippy. We're like, I'm holding on to the thing. I'm grippy, grippy, grippy. And I'm like, oh, I want to know. I want to understand. And I, and I have to control it. And it's all mine. And, you know, this grippiness. Let it go. <laughs> I'm and so I'm so with you I'm so with you on this and like oh we could have a million chats and I hope we will have I'd love to have you on and we can talk about some specific things because we like if we talk on one topic it's going to go wow so we've got lots of topics we can talk about but just to finish you wanted to say something about writing so what did you want to say about that and then we'll oh yeah to- when so you know my whole life people have said oh you should be a writer You know, it's like you you write so well and you're la 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 with words. And and there's been a couple of key people since my very young years who've really just sort of championed within me, like you have books in you, you need to write. And I've never been able to do it. And I've never really felt even that compelled to do it, honestly, other than a couple of little waves here and there in my late teens. Um, But still there's been this kind of story has been there. When these stories kind of came through and they just like came through like this huge flood, like this huge river, this torrent of like, oh my God, how can I even keep up with this? And, you know, creating the different capture mechanisms. I talk a lot about capture mechanisms with gifted people. It's so important to grab the different things that are coming through and to start to kind of make sense of it. The actual work of writing, I feel is one, is one of the most, if not the most sort of painfully 3D processes there is, you know? I mean, it's like, Letter, 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 space. Okay, now we have a word. Do it again. Like, it's so fucking linear. Oh, my God. It's maddening. It's like makes you, it's just crazy making. Um, And I love writing and it's beautiful, but it's also fucking painful. And I can remember the first time I really had this like kind of come kind of call to Jesus with my with my cosmic self and, and and all the different kind of guiding energies that are that are beings that are with me. I was like, why did we have to do it as writing? Like Jesus is so painful. Oh my God, it's the worst. And they're like, can you imagine giving up on these stories? Can you imagine just letting them go and not doing it? I'm like, no, that sounds like a terror. I'm not, I won't do that timeline. I'm not interested in that timeline. Mm-hmm. They have to, they have, I have to finish them. It's mm-hmm. just so much fun. It's so important. It's so powerful. All these characters that are described in here are beings that I feel super connected to. 
they have to come through. Mm. Okay, great. That forces you, forces me, my human, to kind of deal with the step-by-step reality of 3D. Mm -hmm. And again, we're not here to escape 3D. We're here to bring the other dimensions here into 3D in our capacity. I mean, they're already here, but we're here to bring our capacity to access all the different dimensions from within this physical 3D container. And it's like a hook that keeps me tied in so that I don't just like leave because that's often like a like, fuck it, I'm out, you know, like, yeah, 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 no, 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 I'm not out. Like that's not, I'm, I'm here, I'm doing it. It's, I'm here for, I want to be doing it. I'm here for it. I sign up for it, you know? Um, but it's, I, I feel like that's something that I just need to share with people who may be having some of those experiences. And particularly if you're identifying as highly gifted, this reality of like, but why do I start things and not finish them? Like it's, this is a big piece of it. This is a really big piece of it. Also, I work with a lot of filmmakers and what I've come to understand is that in many ways, filmmaking is actually even worse from a linear perspective, from a time as a line perspective. And I have such like awe for the way filmmakers can hold and focus on one project for years. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's years, even if everything flows perfectly, it is years from like, oh, we have this idea to like, it's actually now a film that's available in the world. Mm. And it's a really, it's an incredible thing. And we, we, we are given these kind of visions and these stories to bring through as a mechanism, I feel in part to also kind of anchor us here, to keep us here in the mm. same way that children can do that as well. Like I felt very much that, you know, my daughter, who's now almost 23, when, you know, when she was born, I mean, it was really clear to me, like, oh, this is really anchoring me to the planet in a way that, <laughs> that, that I would not be, I would not have made it through all of those 22 years, I don't think if I didn't have that anchor of just like, no, I'm not leaving her. That's not going to happen. You know, and there's a sort of a partnership energy, if you will, in a cosmic sense there. And she's also my favorite human. She's amazing, total delight and, you know, just a wonderful being. Um, so, you know, and having some of these similar, you know, like the, the interest in labels and the difficulties with boxes and, you know, her journey is her journey, but I, I'm with you. I, was, I thought I was going to have loads of kids. I was, I was like, I did too. I thought I would have many, and then it was yeah. just the one. It was one that was meant to come through. And the moment I had, I was like, whoa, okay, I'll do mum. What is this mum thing? This is really strange. And I never Four got pregnant volume. again, ever, ever. And it wasn't that I didn't love being a mum, but it was hard. I adored yeah. my child, but I, I can't do this again. I've got this one being to work out and. Yeah, somehow yeah. help meet the needs of that's enough beside yeah. me right and so anyway yeah. it's yeah. if any other parents ever felt like that yeah wow no, it's true it's true uh, melanie you well, like carrying a carrying a being in your body is like you know built you know creating a being in your body is i mean it's a game changer we, we could talk about that another time from this perspective because i think you know creating the space for star seeds to enter for you know the consciousness that's ready for this planet now you know to, to come through it's just it's a powerful thing and that's my real area I, I believe we can really see peace peace as a truth in our in our planetary yeah. you know cohesiveness through through the birthing practices through the conception pregnancy and birthing practices and nurturing practices can, can I ask you one question mm. about about star peace I really, I mean, I, I, I love, I, so I love wordplay, of course, right? So the kind of star piece versus star wars thing, I, I think is really beautiful. I want to go a little deeper for just one minute with you around like peace. As a dynamic state. Versus harmony. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't mean versus like, uh, in a like head to head kind of competition way, but like, I want to put those together and hear you speak about that and kind of come more closely into your own, uh, mental models around that, if that's okay. Well, I think for, for the first thing for me has been around peace seems boring to most people. The idea of peace, as, I, as I've connected to it, it's kind of like a calm lake where nothing's really going on. And I don't think I want that. And I don't think anyone really wants that. Um, and so harmony and balance. I mean, I've worked a lot with ceremonial cacao, with mama cacao. So this right. bringer of balance and harmony and compassion. I'm not interested in balance, just to... Sorry, just, you know, just harmony, just harmony. I'm interested in harmony. No, and I mean, I, 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 I really, I'm so sorry. I just totally interrupted you. That was really rude. And I, it's a, it's a problem for me sometimes to interrupt. So I apologize for that. Um, I feel like balance stays, keeps, stays down in polarity, whereas harmony is like. I know, mean, balance as neutrality. Yeah. 
that's how I see it. You know, when you talk okay. about neutrality, for me, it's like going from those extremes and finding mm -hmm. what is that midline that you want to surf. We've talked about delight, right? And like for yeah. me, yeah. that excites me. Delight is my midline. It's where I want to yeah. come back to. So yeah. when I think about harmony, I'm a singer in my background. It's like yeah. how are these different, beautiful, all these different frequencies can come together and the vision I was given a star piece just very quickly, and we, you know, I will bring to close of that, is that I saw this, this vision of a game of chess, right? Like the old world was this, this chess game of duality. And then I just saw the hand of the divine go and move yep. it out of the way and then just dump like all these puzzle pieces, right? And the puzzle pieces are the puzzle of paradise, earth, heaven on earth, whatever we want to create as an ascended state. But every one of us is a unique piece of the puzzle. We have one here. It's our star map, right? We activate it. So the whole point of this was, you know, I have interviewed some people and so I could say to you, we're on very different ends of this puzzle. Like we're, it's difficult to harmonize. It's difficult to translate. It takes a lot of energy to do that. But we can't, if we strip away the semantics, the essential message is the same. So we can agree on that, that we're all part of it. So does that answer your question? Because it's yeah. it's about those different filters. It wasn't even so much a question as it was. I was just interested in yeah, cool. hearing more um, more of that. So yeah, absolutely. There's Thank a really you. cool um, really card fun. in an Oracle deck I've got, which is like a, an image that's made up of everyone doing their own individual thing that creates a unified image. And I just yeah. love that because yeah. I love harmony. When I hear harmonization, yeah. you know, and, and even, I mean, I don't know that it's it's how it's how, I I see numbers as colors and there's all all of that yeah. thing going on yeah. in my, my life. Right? Yeah, 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 me yeah. too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So the for me, it's the idea of what what would it feel like here? Like if the message was, I was literally seeing all the warships leaving our universe, going into a black hole, continuing their adventure somewhere else, but not in this universe because it's being declared we want a different experience. But it's the fun of creating that in challenging circumstances. How do we bring ha harmony and, well, I'd say about neutrality to lead to harmony to, to then bring in these codes yeah. here? And it's accepting, like you said, that everything is valid, right? Yeah. And it's like, let's allow that. Let's allow that and let's see where we are in all of this. But there are, it's like Russian dolls. Anyway, I could go on and on and on, but it's all in here. It's all going to be here. <laughs> Yes. No. So fun. I love this. It's super fun. I was a great conversation and I feel like I, we could talk for hours and uh, hopefully we'll have more of these conversations and uh, love to. yeah, absolutely. So sure. super fun. Well, everybody, I'm sure you have enjoyed this as much as I have, and we'll make sure that we have all of Melanie's links so you can catch up with the, with the transmissions and also what you were saying about that was the foundation keys, was it? um yeah, founder codes founder mm -hmm. codes right there, there's I mean, and if you want to be an early reader for star silver child awakens like i'm i'm op i've opened up a very kind of informal process for people kind of being an early reader and i'm really actually i'm actively looking for um for people of all ages who enjoy who enjoy the idea of reading kind of a full-length novel that's sort of fantasy magical realism like whatever you want to call it um in terms of genre stuff and and I would love, love, love to just have more people kind of added to that to be able to have that experience. And I'm creating a little private chat channel to talk about the book and to talk about kind of writing experience and things like that. Um, and just kind of getting started with that. And I don't know when I'm gonna actually publish it. It's not quite that was the next yet. question. <laughs> the artwork, the artwork issue is I mean, it's so important to me what it looks like, but but having the book cover be the way that I sort of see it, I have to find the right artist for that um you know and to kind of get it to get it out hopefully it'll be soon um in in human time uh but what came through was it's time to start talking to people about the book and for them to be reading it and like you know that that's just it's just time so I just was like oh I didn't do I didn't know we we're gonna do this but okay like here we go I you know put up this page and put up a sign up option and uh and sign and me up so yeah. I mean, I'm there yeah. and you know that that sounds wonderful because it again it feels very dynamic and it's it's yeah. co-creation because that energy will be coming back in won't it 
and it will yeah. be published in divine timing as always. Yeah, always. Exactly. And it's been interesting with the story writing over time. There've been times when I've been like, why is the story not progressing? Like I need to, why am I, I know the story. Why am I not like, damn it. You know, it's been like a week and I haven't written anything or whatever. Or like it should be done by now. And I'll get into these human sort of like er, moments, you know, and then something will occur energetically on some big scale. And then the next day I'll like write something and, and what I write essentially is creating some big new sort of master frequency code. And then there'll be a like thing that occurs that be even bigger and it'll tie into that. And someone will be like, oh, that's why we didn't, we need like these inflection points that are occurring in various ways. We're all interacting with those in different, in different ways. But yeah, if you want to sign up, it's at melaniegillespie.com forward slash seven stars and seven is spelled out. Um, but we'll we'll put the links in. So yeah, yeah we'll we'll put the links in. And I won't, and you won't get any other kinds of emails from me if you give me your email to get access to that. There won't be like now you're added to other lists and you're gonna get n none of that. It's very I'm very I hate that. That totally bums me out when people start spamming me with shit. <laughs> Mm -hmm. cool cool well I love I love how you just say it as you see it and you're very much a co-creator of your world and not actually buying into how things should be done I really appreciate that because it's taken me so much it's taken me a lot to get to this point to have the confidence to do the same to actually really listen to my energy if my energy feels like I have to do this and it's really not life or death then I don't have to do it it's just conditioning and it's bs right and it's yep. like, it, when my energy's there and I'm excited, that's the time to do it. And that's not grabbing me. So why would I try and force myself to make it work for me? Like, stop that yep. fucking shit. So, well, and, and to have the capacity to kind of have the discernment around, is that not grabbing me because it's, does, it's not truly aligned? Or is it not grabbing me because I have kind of still plugged in what I call sort of childhood directives mm -hmm. that are based on the old evolutionary stuff because I haven't done that work? right? Mm -hmm. Because there's no getting away from that work, mm -hmm. that that kind of, you know, and, and, and at a minimum, the human level work of, you know, the, the kind of core of those first seven to 10 years. Um, like in, you said, it's, it's nervous format. system, brain, and what was the third thing you said? Spirit. Spirit. Yeah, that's exactly what, you know, that's what came through to me to offer. I brought two different elements together. And it's like, <laughs> You need it all, and we're all, we're all doing it in slightly different ways, and you go with what you resonate, right? Exactly, yes. Yeah. <sighs> and part of what we're doing is we're helping more and more people be able to essentially offer that yeah. in their way, because we need, like, we I mean, we need so much more of it. It's so interesting. Every now and then, people will invite me to come and talk on their, on their shows or whatever, and there's a very, like, very like kind of a very scarcity kind of model of like, I'm the only person who blah, blah, blah. And, and everybody should only come to me and you can't do that work or you can only go to Melanie. You have to go to Melanie. You could only like, Please no, don't do that. that's yeah. crazy. No. And we want more people to come in. Like they're, they're not your competition, like more, let's do more. Let's have more. Let's normalize it. Let's normalize this conversation and let's normalize this work because that's actually what's going to shift the external paradigms around our societal norms and that's actually where that whole you know what what people want to create and what they're here for you know new earth paradise on earth heaven on earth whatever language you want to use for it as you said well this is i i'm of the belief like i've really come to this point that from my experience we create from our frequency right so it's a very interesting thing what we put out in the world i stopped singing as an example because i only ever sang about heartbreak and I did mm. not, there was this instinctive, I do not want to put this vibration to the world because the songs that I would most resonate with would be the ones that, and I'm going to make a video about this soon because it's just come through, is like heartbroken, I need you, I'm going to die, like total eclipse of the heart. I'm like, that's not love, actually. That is just a distortion of love. And there's so much of it going on. So my passion is working with creatives to kind of support them to love up their pain body if you like and make these connections so instead of creating from that programming they're bringing that higher self-consciousness in yeah. and yeah. I would just be fascinated Lana Wachowski you know you know the whole Matrix movies her and her sister yeah and I'm like wow we did some work together what would you create because you can see the distortions right I can see you know the, the yeah. no no I mean it, it's so interesting I I actually just the other day um so my most recent episode of Luminosity um, addresses a whole bunch of different stuff, but it addresses kind of apathy as kind of both medicine and venom. And uh, yeah, okay, I'm not gonna go down the rabbit hole of this, mm -hmm. but before 
no, after, I can't remember the timing now, that's hilarious. But around the time that that transmission came through, I was guided to rewatch uh, part of the uh, most recent, the new Matrix movie. I don't remember all the titles, sorry, but the new Matrix movie. And there was like a little, like, it was like, okay, we're gonna rewatch that, fine, that'll be story time, put it on. And it wasn't that something, there wasn't anything that was happening in the, in the, in the movie per se directly, but just something in the energetics allowed something else within me to kind of open in a way that I needed, that I was working with related to, excuse me, some of the things that I was speaking about in the latest transmission. Mm -hmm. And then this, I, I can't believe I forgot to talk about this. Oh my God. I'm sorry. Just two more minutes or five more minutes. Um, then uh, recently, you know, the new movie, Everything Everywhere All at Once. People are talking about that movie quite a bit. I don't know if you've seen it. People are talking about that and they're like, oh my God, you know, one of the things that makes me laugh is I watch some of these movies and I'm like, it's a documentary. It's not a fantasy. It's not science fiction. Um, but with everything everywhere all at once, when I first saw the ad for it, I was like, oh yeah, I can't wait to see that. As soon as it came out though, I kept having this like, no, 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 not yet. No, 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 not yet. And I was like, what is going on for me with this movie? Like, why am I not watching this movie? Like, can we watch this movie, please? Like, what the fuck? And, uh, and then finally I just kind of like gave up on it. I was like, whatever. Last night I got this, uh, I got the ping like, okay, now I've watched the movie. And I was like, now, like, yeah, now that's story time tonight. I'm like, okay. And I put on the movie and I had just that morning, uh, shared this, you know, 45 minute long transmission that talks quite a bit about apathy. And in the middle of the movie, people who've seen the movie will know what I'm talking about. There's a scene that comes into kind of a section in the middle of the movie with the daughter character. And, it, and I was just like, oh my God, that's why we had to wait. Like I had to bring this other thing through. And then I see this scene and I was just like, the movie's narrating everything back to me. Like it was just crazy. And I love those moments. It's so fun. Life imitates art or does life imitate? It, well, art imitate people, life. people who are kind of creating, creating art that are just they're just bringing shit through like yeah and I love that I all you know when I feel it like oh you know um yeah. I I definitely have you know in my awareness some of these kind of bigger like like Sean Levy is a filmmaker that I absolutely want to work with you know um free guy what's Susan, his name John John Sean Levy Sean Levy we'll just energize yeah. this okay yeah. let, let's let we'll bring this to a close so we can leave everybody wanting for some more and we will come back and anyone who does watch this, if there's anything, any particular way you would like us to go next, just let us know and I'll bring Melanie back on. Honestly, Star Sister, so good to have you here. I'm sending you a big hug. And everybody, yeah. I'm sure you've been as, as inspired as I have. We'll put all the details up for you and do just make the most of all of this because this is it. We're creating a new reality for maybe what we want. Yeah. So Thank much love, you. love, love, love. Mwah. So much love to you. Yay. So fun. Thank you.